Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Ground Round. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Scott Wilhelm as our ground, Grand Round speaker today to discuss the updated guidelines to the management of primary hyperparathyroidism. Dr. Wilhelm received his medical degree from the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. He went on to complete residency in general surgery here at University Hospitals and subsequently completed a fellowship in advanced endocrine surgery at Rush Presbyterian St. Luke's Medical Center. Dr. Wilhelm holds the title of Associate Professor in Surgery and is the Endocrine Surgery Section Head. Dr. Wilhelm is a member of multiple societies, including the American College of Surgeons and American Association of Endocrine Surgeons, where he holds the position of Program Committee Chairman. Dr. Wilhelm has multiple original publications to his name, including 11 first author publications, multiple presentations, abstracts, and book chapters, including the first author on the American Association of Endocrine Surgeon Guidelines for Definitive Management of Primary Hyperparathyroidism. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wilhelm. So thank you very much for having me here today. Um, thank you, Keith, and thank you, Deb, for the uh, the invite by means of, by means of so exactly. Um, so today I want to talk a little bit about um, something that was kind of near and dear to my heart. Uh, it was a big project that we worked on uh, for about two years, and that was to come up with an updated set of um, guideline management, basically for hyperparathyroidism. Um, we'll talk about what's out there already and sort of why these developed, um, but it was actually a really uh, fantastic undertaking, uh, something that I, I didn't quite realize what I was getting into when I started the process. It turned out to be a lot bigger than what I really thought, but I think it came out with some really good results. Um, we're going to focus more on, I hope, um, for what would be useful for you, and that is what do we need to do to work up uh, hyperparathyroidism? What are... Um, the rationales for referring a patient, what things might be helpful in the process of getting the patient ready for referral, um, and then what do we do if things go wrong and we're, we've got a situation where someone's got recurrent disease. And we'll kind of focus a little bit on those things. I'm not going to go into a huge backlog into what hyperparathyroidism is. Hopefully we've got a pretty reasonable basic understanding of that. So um, no disclosures and all members of the guideline panel, no disclosures that were relevant either. Um, so when we talk about the actual panel itself, we had a large group of people, and this was our group. Um, so handsome guy here in the back. Uh, so there were basically uh, several of us that were sort of the younger uh, authors in the group, myself, Dr. Sturgeon from Northwestern, Dr. Ruin, who's now down in Tampa, Florida, Dr. Wang, uh, who's in Milwaukee, uh, and Dr. James Lee, who's in New York. And we were sort of the core authorship writing group. Um, the impetus for this whole thing was Dr. Sally Carty, She's the uh, former president of the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons. Each president kind of usually takes on a task at the end of their uh, year of what their project is that they want to sort of leave as their presidential legacy. And this was really her, her idea and concept. Um, and then multiple other uh, former presidents, including uh, Dr. Dew, uh, Dr. Perrier is in line to become president, uh, Dr. Udelsman. Um, Sylvia Asa was our pathologist uh, who's up in uh, Toronto. Uh, Shawnee Silverberg, a name probably certainly known to Dr. Arafa and maybe some others in the group, um, leading endocrinologist and bone metabolism specialist in the country. Uh, Miguel Herrera from Mexico City, another former president. Mitch Tublin, uh, our uh, endocrine radiologist uh, from University of Pittsburgh, and then multiple other uh, faculty members. So it really was an outstanding group of people and a nice uh, multidisciplinary group as well that we had a chance to work with, which was a lot of fun. So the guidelines themselves, there's two formats that are available to you. Um, the executive summary was actually published in JAMA Surgery last October. Um, it is available free for download on the entire JAMA uh, web link site. And then in addition to this, this is sort of the abbreviated uh, version. The full version is 175 pages roughly uh, with all of the full guidelines, all supporting evidence, tables, background information, everything that's also available, and it's also free for download as well. So what else is out there, and, and why did we sort of get started on this? So uh, probably the foremost, you know, the initial paper that really came out was the initial NIH Consensus Development Panel, and this was uh, primarily led by Dr. John Belazikian, uh, endocrinologist. And then in addition to that, there was a subset of surgeons that were on the panel, but certainly a, a much more medical-driven panel overall. This then kind of uh, went through multiple iterations and now is down to what we have, the summary statement from the fourth international workshop that was just published in uh, 2014. So this has gone through multiple iterations from 1991 up to 2014. 
And then ACE, which is the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, our uh, co-society with the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons, um, that basically came out with a, a position statement, which was sort of an updated uh, version in the NIH guidelines as well. So if we've got all these other guidelines out there, why do we really need a new set of guidelines? So one of the big things is that the surgical management of hyperparathyroidism has undergone a lot of change. Um, we have a lot of new techniques, minimally invasive parathyroidectomy, uh, which is something that I really brought here that we got started uh, when I came back on faculty here in 2003. We've been doing almost for 15 years here now. Intraoperative parathyroid hormone monitoring, improved imaging techniques, and some changes in definitions of disease that we'll talk about. Um, the other thing is that despite having guidelines out there, there's still a lot of variation in how people actually practice, how people refer, and when people decide that somebody actually needs surgery or who should just undergo ongoing surveillance. Um, and then there's been a, a fair amount of disagreement on that. And so we really wanted to try to look at this from some other potential perspectives. So when we wrote the guidelines, we had a few goals. One, provide caregivers, and that is, you know, people on the front lines in medicine, endocrinologists, and then surgeons, ENTs, anyone who's, you know, involved in the practice of this disease to give a good understanding of the epidemiology and the pathogenesis to really outline what needs to be done in terms of laboratory studies, what sort of clinical manifestations might be useful in helping to get us to the point of referring people, and then looking overall at the overall indications for when we should intervene surgically. We wanted to detail the, both the pre-op and the intraoperative management, including a very, what we termed, you know, patient-specific operative plan. And I don't think this is anything that's different in what's going on in medicine across the board today. Very patient-centric, you know, we're really looking at, if you take, you know, breast cancer, and we're looking at oncotypes, and like, you know, who do we need to refer, who do we need genetic analysis in, and how are we going to taper an individual's chemotherapy? All that's really going to be coming online, where we're going to treat one patient, not, you know, a shotgun approach to breast cancer, and the same thing's happening across the board with other things. And then looking at uh, post-operative management, how do we define cure of disease, and therefore, what would we also consider operative failure, and if that happens, how do we manage that? So, the, again, the main objective was to come up with these guidelines, really to uh, enhance a, a nice, safe, and effective uh, panel. We mentioned that this is a multidisciplinary group. We looked at the English literature for about 30 years. We also threw in classic literature that predated that as well. Um, we used the American College of Physicians grading system uh, in order to actually come up with consensus guidelines. And with the ACP, there's really two parts to it. The first is the actual grading designation, strong, weak, or insufficient. Um, and then in addition to that, then what's the strength of the recommendation? Where does the data come from? So a high recommendation would be randomized controls or large studies with overall overwhelming evidence. Moderate would be randomized control trials with some limitations or large cohort studies, large observational type trials. And low would be smaller groups, smaller case studies and things like that. And each individual guideline bullet pointed it goes through that whole uh, process. So after the guidelines were written, we then asked for formal feedback uh, out to a group of independent uh, non-authors, and that was both uh, medical and surgical. Once those came back, it went to the entire uh, AAS group, and it was online for about a month for our membership to review and then give us feedback. Um, we cleaned it up, and then it went out for peer review uh, for publication purposes. Again, came out in October. and. You know, obviously, like with any guidelines, it's not meant to be the only approach. It's hopefully a rational pathway to work your way through, but you still have to individualize it to each patient and base it on what's available in your own work environment. So, you know, when we talk about today's society, everything's got a meme. So, you know, we've got our local teams. We've got our local brand. We've got the state of Ohio that we live in, and it's kind of interesting, you know, so, of course, I just wanted to look out there and see if you type in calcium hyperparathyroidism meme, what do you get? <laughs> and so it's just kind of fun. I mean, there's like a meme for everything. I didn't create this. This was out there. So it's just kind of fun stuff. But So when we came up with the guidelines, we really wanted to have sort of our own meme or our own theme that really went along with this. And we were kind of fortunate that um, Dr. Udelsman, who's on our panel, who, number one, is a phenomenal parathyroid surgeon at Yale, uh, also happens to be a surgical illustrator. And he actually uh, drew this for us, um, so that he created this specifically for the guidelines. Um, and it really outlines both, you know, normal parathyroid positions around the thyroid, 
but then outlines, you know, places where something might show up in the mediastinum or an undescended gland, and it's just a beautiful drawing um, and really kind of was just a, a phenomenal thing that we actually have to put in with the guidelines. So this is also seen in the JAMA uh, presentation as well. So we go back to our goals. So first thing is to give us an understanding of the epidemiology and pathogenesis of the disease. So we talk about hyperparathyroidism. The majority of what we're going to see really is sporadic disease, and that is it's going to come up mostly going to be single adenoma disease, uh, hyperplasia can occur in very rare, less than 1% cancers. Um, sporadic disease, it's fairly common. It can happen in up to ultimately 2% of American women. There's about 100,000 new cases every year. So if you want to put that in perspective, there's 150,000 new colon cancers per year. We hear a lot about colon cancer, but probably not as much about hyperparathyroidism, but it's a very common disorder. There's acquired disease um, from things such as lithium, ionizing radiation exposure, amiodarone, different things that can result. So again, it's important to know from a historical standpoint for the patient. And then inherited disease, and this is really diseases such as the multiple endocrine neoplasia syndromes, uh, things less common, jaw tumor syndrome, there is something that's uh, termed familial isolated hyperparathyroidism as well. And so there are these, these different things that sort of come in. And understanding where you start really understands what the disease pathogenesis is going to be and what you need to think about surgically. So. In patients who have a suspected history of this, we really want to make sure we get a good personal and family history. Again, this isn't rocket science that we would think about, but it's important because it really is going to pan into, you know, then what's the next step. So if you start getting people who have things that look suspicious to you, such as young age, less than 40, uh, history of multi-gland disease in the family, that's the time you really need to start thinking also about genetic counseling and start looking for MEN syndromes or other abnormalities. And the thing that's important, again, is these exposure-related and genotype-phenotype correlations are going to predict what the parathyroid anatomy is, is what you're going to find at the time of surgery, and how you plan to conduct your operation. So we take, for example, MEN1. Uh, hyperparathyroidism will happen in about 90% of these patients. Multi-gland disease here, though, is the norm. They do get hyperplasia. So in this particular group, we're really not going to offer somebody like this a minimally invasive parathyroidectomy. That's not the right operation because they're going to have multi-gland disease. We also know that if you go in and operate on these people for multi-gland disease, um, even with an initial cure rate right after surgery that approaches that of primary disease, their recurrence rate is going to be high. And it's not a matter of if they're going to recur, it's a matter of when they're going to recur. So it's not that you did a bad operation, it's just the disease process is such that these glands, they're already abnormal, they're going to rehypertrophy in the future. So it gives you a few options. We can do a subtotal parathyroidectomy and remove three or three and a half of the glands and leave a portion in the neck. We can take all the parathyroids out and auto-transplant some into the forearm. And some groups have also advocated doing cervical thymectomy in these patients because about maybe 5 to 13% of the population has a fifth parathyroid gland that may reside in the thymus or in another uh, aberrant location. So these are possible things. Um, they all carry different risks and benefits. And the recommendation that really came out from our group, again, this is tailored in uh, one specific point, is that for these people, subtotal parathyroidectomy is really recommended now at the index operation. And the idea being that cervical thymectomy is probably a bit aggressive in these patients. When you're talking total parathyroidectomy, the downside is, is that even with an autotransplant, you may get failure of the autotransplant. You could leave somebody permanently hypoparathyroid and permanently hypocalcemic, and that can be an equally difficult and equally devastating problem to these patients uh, than their hyperparathyroidism as well. So again, it's more to the concept of making sure you understand what's the pathogenesis, what's the epidemiology to do the right operation. So our second point was really to outline process of diagnosis, and then once we've established that, how are we going to refer people for intervention? So the main thing we're really going to focus on is we term hypercalcemic primary hyperparathyroidism. And again, this is high calcium levels above the normal range and an inappropriately or high uh, level of PTH. There is also a condition we call normal calcemic hyperparathyroidism. Here we have high PTH, but normal um, serum and ionized calcium levels. And this is a disease that, you know, we don't just randomly diagnose this. This is usually patients that have already been going through problems, and they're oftentimes referred from a rheumatologist for unexplained osteoporosis that's getting worse, unexplained kidney stones that we can't put a handle on, and then someone all of a sudden puts, you know, they start 
adding other tests. I mean, these people have a normal calcium, so they're not being referred to us for workup of hyperparathyroidism. It's usually they've got something else going on. But you also have to make sure why is their PTH high? Do they have some other reason or rationale for that? And we'll talk a little bit about that. So for hypercalcemic primary hyperparathyroidism, really what people need is a total serum calcium. We need a PTH. We recommend a creatinine because second one cause of secondary hyperparathyroidism is renal dysfunction. And vitamin D levels, again, are another cause of secondary hyperparathyroidism. And certainly coming out of winter and the way it looks out there today, I think everybody's vitamin D level is low here in the room. I know mine is. So, uh, And if we look at, uh, you know, in addition to that, when do we start recommending? So parathyroidectomy is really indicated when the serum level of calcium is at least one milligram per deciliter above normal. And this is regardless of objective symptoms, and it's something we'll talk about that come from different guidelines, and it really agrees with current guidelines that are out there. And just a quick statement again on normal calcemic. Again, this is high PTH, normal serum calcium. These people need a much more involved workup. You've got to get an ionized calcium. We need to be looking very closely at their renal function, their GFR, vitamin D. We might start sending 24-hour urine uh, calciums and get calcium clearances to look for familial uh, scenarios like hypercalcemic, hy hypercalcemic, hypocalciuria, things like that. So a lot of other different things that go in. We won't get too much into that today. And then surgical indications. So we'll kind of talk about what's most common. So when we talk about hyperparathyroidism, we talk about the bones, stones, groans, those types of things. And so if we look at the tra traditional objective criteria that are out there, so from a renal standpoint, presence or suspicion of renal stone. Um, this agrees with the current Fourth International Workshop that we mentioned earlier. Um, when we talk about urine calcium levels, once urine calcium levels get above 400 milligrams per deciliter and a normal range is about 100 to 300, it puts people at an increased risk to develop kidney stones. This was actually taken out of the third international guideline um, from the NIH, and it was actually put back in because they recognized that they were seeing more problems with patients with stones, and so it has come back into favor there. And so, again, this really is um, considered the norm at this point. And then also, um, if renal stones are suspected, patients are having abdominal pain we can't explain. We should start doing things, simple things, oftentimes renal ultrasound or CT scan if they've been through an emergency room workup. And if we're seeing stones plus high calcium, those patients really need to be identified and evaluated for surgery. So parathyroidectomy is indicated for objective evidence of renal involvement, which the stones can be silent. They could be simply found on CT, um, but the risk is they could ultimately then go on to cause problems. Uh, nephrocalcinosis, hypercalciuria, as mentioned, or patients who have impaired renal function, we at least need to consider referring them for parathyroidectomy. Bone-related disease. So, again, no changes to the traditional criteria that were already outlined. So, when we talk about DEXA scans, we're talking T-scores less than minus 2.5 is osteoporosis, pathologic fractures, or diagnosis of uh, primary hyperparathyroidism at age less than 50. Again, remember, this disease is most common in women, three to one ratio women to men. So if you're seeing women who have hypercalcemia before age 50, they're probably in the premenopausal group at that age. They're already gonna go on to develop an increased risk of osteoporosis when they go through menopause. So if they start out already behind the eight ball with hyperparathyroidism, with PTH that's stealing calcium and demineralizing bone, putting them at a potential increased risk for disease, we may accelerate their process for becoming osteoporotic and going on to pathologic fractures. And if we look at some of Dr. Silverberg's work, this was the large study that was done in the New England Journal trial, and they really looked at, well, what happens if we observe patients? So they took, and they just really analyzed patients. This isn't randomized because these were patients that had mild primary hyperparathyroidism, and the patients either opted for surgery or they said, I don't want surgery, and both groups were followed. And if they were observed, what we saw is that in the groups that um, underwent parathyroidectomy, there was increased bone density, redeposit at the femoral neck within 10 years after their surgery. And in the observation group, we had ongoing bone loss, both in the radius and the femoral neck at the 15-year point. So these patients were clearly going on to increase uh, disease process. And there's going to be a big study coming out from UCLA probably within the next year that also now adds in data to this, including bisphosphonate therapy for osteoporosis, showing that the parathyroidectomy group still had superior outcomes and that the addition of bisphosphonates did not add a whole lot. So that data is not published yet, but it will be coming. So good, you know, just outline summary slide of 
who should be at least considered for referral for surgery? Calcium greater than one milligram per deciliter above upper normal. The reason that that kind of got chosen was because the original guidelines came out and said 12 milligrams per deciliter. When it got revised, it came out and they said 11 and a half. And then they sort of realized that there's just a lot of variation in labs. If you look at our lab, for example, up till a year ago, our upper end of calcium was 10.1. Here at UH, it's now 10.6. It's not that all of a sudden we feel like patients can tolerate a higher calcium. It's the lab range and the lab testing format changes. So it's things that you have to sort of factor in. Um, we mentioned low GFR, high urine calcium, osteoporosis or pathologic fractures, age less than 50, and you know, patients who just may not be able to comply with observation at least should be considered for referral. It doesn't mean that the patient has to undergo surgery, but at least think about potentially sending them. When we talk about asymptomatic or non-traditional uh, symptoms, this is the group of things that are a little, you know, a little muddier in the water. So neurocognitive symptoms that we'll talk about here a little bit more, cardiac symptoms, you know, muscle weakness, the GI, some of the GI symptoms, abdominal pain, constipation, sleep disorders, things like that. The current guidelines that come from the NIH certainly acknowledge that these symptoms may be attributable to par uh, hyperparathyroidism, but they certainly wouldn't advise surgical intervention for them. The one thing that I think that, that are the new guidelines disagree with a bit is really mainly in the, in the neurocognitive symptoms. So at this point, there's now been three very large randomized controlled trials, uh, two from the medical literature and then one from the surgical literature um, that have come out really, um, you know, within the last 10 years that really show that neurocognitive symptoms can improve. All three studies utilized the SS36 uh, scoring sale, scales, and they looked at multiple different domains, bodily pain, general health, um, emotional role functioning, things like this, and they did show that there were multiple improvements in those. So the, probably the biggest difference in the guidelines uh, from a referral standpoint is that we are recommending that patients be considered for referral if they have neurocognitive or neuropsychiatric symptoms. The important thing on my end is once the patient gets to, to us is to tell them, you know, what are our potential expectations? Obviously, there's a lot that plays into depression or mental fogginess or feeling fatigued and tired. Um, we're certainly not telling people that parathyroidectomy is a cure-all for what they have, but it is pretty amazing how many patients actually report improvement, and sometimes their symptoms might be attributable, and they may be able to gain benefit from surgery. So it's worth a discussion. When we get into the other asymptomatics, so cardiac. So there's a, most of the, the literature that comes out for cardiac changes in hyperparathyroidism. A lot of it comes from uh, literature out of Brazil and from Sweden. Um, and there's been some things that have been shown. There is an increased incidence of myocardial infarction, stroke and congestive heart failure in patients who have hyperparathyroidism. Now, again, is parathyroidectomy going to fix that? We're certainly not to that point. But there are some things that have been shown. By decreasing PTH levels with parathyroidectomy, left ventricular hypertrophy has been shown to go down. There's some data out there that shows that left ventricular stroke work improves on echocardiogram serially. So there are some things that suggest there could be potential benefits, but overall survival is not affected. There's no major change in the risk of cardiovascular mortality with parathyroidectomy. So, again, something to consider, but we're not, not certainly recommending a referral at this point. Lots of studies showing really no improvement in hypertension after parathyroidectomy. Maybe less than 10% of patients may show some change in blood pressure after surgery, but it's not meant to fix hypertension. So our recommendation was tailored to kind of say that parathyroidectomy may be offered to surgical candidates with cardiovascular disease and it may potentially lead to some mitigation of cardiovascular sequelae. But, again, weak recommendation, low-quality evidence. I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done to show if we're going to get any long-term benefits. The other thing that's kind of interesting is um, cost-effectiveness of the surgery itself. So there are no other guidelines that really look at cost-effectiveness, and that's becoming a big part of medicine across the board in general. So. There was a study that came out in 2006 actually looking at observation of hyperparathyroidism versus synecalcid. Synecalcid, uh, basically the concept here is, this is Sensapar. Um, the idea is, is that our parathyroid glands are tuned in to the calcium levels in our system. Some patients, their calcium set point of the parathyroid starts to go higher. So now with a calcium, say, of 11.5, a normal person, their PTH should shut off and it should go away in the system.
The idea behind synecalcid is to try to reset the sense, sensation point of the parathyroid gland to the relative amount of calcium in your system. It is not FDA approved for primary hyperparathyroidism. It's primary loose used in, like, Dr. Dingra's patients with secondary hyperparathyroidism. We do sometimes use it in patients who are poor surgical candidates, though, with primary disease, or for parathyroid cancer patients when things are failing uh, from a surgical standpoint. So it still has a role. But basically, this study looked at using observation versus meds versus surgery for patients with hyperparathyroidism and showed that operative intervention really remains cost-effective until the quality-adjusted life years gets to be about 15000 per year. The cost of a parathyroidectomy at UH hospitals is roughly $15,000 from the surgical and anesthesia and the operative time and all that. So within one year, you sort of meet potential goals. So one, one potential measure. And again, remember, these are all costs. They're not what charges are, of course. Uh, Sinecalcid doesn't become effective unless the drug companies are going to give it to us for $200 a year, which we know that's never going to happen. Uh, although, I guess with our, our Medicaid changes, we're going to drop all of our Medicaid costs now by 10% apparently coming up here. So, uh, Parathyroidectomy is overall definitely more cost-effective than observation for managing patients um, who, who do meet the criteria for referral. So it is certainly something to, again, consider for referral process. What are we going to do to, again, then look at these people before and after surgery and intraoperatively? What, what can we do? So preoperative planning. One part of minimally invasive parathyroidectomy is finding the glands. So Dr. Dotman, who actually led the endocrine radiology program at the NIH, had a really nice, uh, fairly famous quote that the only good localization that study that you need is the localized and experienced endocrine surgeon. And uh, I would tend to agree with that. But I think we can certainly uh, do a lot better these days. We've gotten really good at finding these things, and it's going to impact our disease for minimally invasive versus a bilateral neck exploration if we can't figure out which gland is the culprit. The important thing to really know, though, is that imaging doesn't play a role in the diagnosis of the disease. We make the diagnosis biochemically and, again, based on referral criteria that we outlined, the subjective and objective criteria. Once we've decided the patient warrants surgery, that's the time then to go ahead and start doing your imaging. Again, if we have a patient that's never going to go on to surgery, um, you know, I don't start ordering these tests. Uh, you know, we do want to be try to be cost effective. And, you know, again, the idea being um, once you've determined somebody is a candidate, they should really refer, be referred on to the person that's, you know, doing the workup and doing the evaluation, if that's the endocrinologist, if that's the surgeon. Um, and, again, you sort of have to have a good idea of, what, can, what happens in your institution? What's the best test in your hands or in your institution to figure out where the problem lies? So current things that are out there, we've got test and EV scans. So this is the traditional 2D planar image. Thyroid gland lights up. We've got an increased uptake uh, for a left inferior parathyroid. Baseline scans done after admission, uh, uh, giving the patient technicium. 20-minute scan, and then we do a delayed two-hour scan. And at the two-hour, the tracer starts to wash out of the thyroid, but it persists in the in the parathyroid glands. I wish they were all this clear. Um, ultrasound imaging. So this is the transverse view with the trachea here, thyroid lobe, and then sitting in behind it, uh, a hypoechoic extrathyroidal mass for a parathyroid gland. I do all my own ultrasounds in the office. For me, it's most important that I just do it myself because, again, it's what I find, and it's where I'm going to go when I'm in at the time of surgery. I bring, actually, a portable ultrasound with me to the operating room here when we go. Our residents get to use it, and, again, it kind of puts right in your head where do I want to be and really helps focus in your, your operative technique and where you're going to get to and get there quickly. Sometimes, though, we get patients that have had surgery elsewhere before. Now we've done these tests, and we can't find it. A newer technique that's coming online is four-dimensional CT scanning. This is pretty cool. Um, it's 3D reconstructions, but the fourth dimension is time, and it has to do with when the contrast is administered and when we look at it. But they can now give us really nice reconstructions where we're finding, you know, an undescended parathyroid gland that we can see on the CT in multiple different cuts, and they give us, you know, reconstruction. So um, this was really kind of pioneered uh, at MD Anderson in Houston. It's starting to expand around the country. We're working on setting up a 4D program here. Um, again, most of the time, we do pretty well with the cheaper tests, but for certain individuals, it's really nice to have some advanced imaging techniques. So, again, for imaging, it's not a referral, you know, not, not to be a guideline for referring a patient. 
And negative imaging doesn't mean the patient isn't a surgical candidate. It just means that we aren't seeing it. They've got the disease biochemically. They may wind up being somebody who's got hyperplasia, and we have to think about multi-gland disease because it's much more common in patients who have negative imaging, but it doesn't mean that they shouldn't be referred for surgery. So the other part of it is what's the role of the surgeon? I think the surgeon needs to look at themselves and say, well, what's my volume? We know that just like with anything, the more you do, the better you are, the better your outcomes are, and the better your patients are going to do. This has been looked at on a surgical, on an individual surgeon in multiple studies. It's been looked at on a hospital-based uh, study. We see increased complications, increased failure rates, and increased need for reoperation in lower volume centers. Again, the surgeon then has to look at, again, going back to patient characteristics. Do we think it's going to be single gland disease? Is it somebody with MEN? Is it reoperative surgery with limited imaging? You know, this is not a patient I think somebody out in the community should be tackling. Hospital resources. What do we have available? Here, we've got everything. We've got IOPTH. We've got advanced imaging techniques. I have frozen section available to me to help us in the operating room. Um, we've got cryopreservation available if we need to freeze tissue away. But again, not every single hospital has all of these things. So again, where you do the surgery might really impact, you know, what your potential outcomes can be and how well you do. So it should be conducted by surgeons who have adequate training and experience in the disease process. They need to choose a good approach that has a high cure rate and a low risk profile and is cost effective. And for patients with persistent or recurrent disease, they really should be referred on to, you know, centers with experience. Operative choice. So we now talk about minimally invasive parathyroidectomy, and it's interesting when you pull this up, there's almost 75 different definitions that are out there at this point as to what it means. What we really sort of define it as for the guidelines is these patients undergo preoperative imaging. We try to use small incisions. We try to do a focused dissection after one gland or at least unilateral, staying on the same side of the neck. And it does have an increased uh, reliance on interoperative technology, such as interop PTH, to confirm that by removing one gland, the other glands are normal and the patient should be cured. Um, and again, bilateral neck exploration is still a, vi a very viable operation, and you should be able to do this operation as well. Um, as I mentioned, for sporadic disease, 80 to 85 percent of patients just typically have a solitary adenoma. That's the patient we're going after with minimally invasive. Who do we want to exclude? We don't want to think about doing this for MEN patients. We don't want to think about doing it for patients with amiodarone or radiation history where there's a much higher rate of multi-gland disease. And patients less than 30, it doesn't mean you can't do a minimally invasive operation, but you really have to be careful about those patients and really use your IOPTH. So it's a focused dissection. You want to employ it in the right patient, and you don't routinely recommend it in somebody where you're suspicious of risk of multi-gland disease. So what do we mean by minimally invasive operation? So we have minimal incision, something we talk, we'll talk a little bit about radio-guided surgery, video-assisted surgery, or endoscopic approaches. And as I mentioned, there's a really nice article that came out in 2015 uh, termed What's in a Name, really talking about how do we define minimally invasive parathyroidectomy, and this is quoted in the guidelines as well. This is one of my patients here. Um, we try to use about a two-and-a-half to three-centimeter incision. We're able to basically go in with some small instruments and dissect out the parathyroid gland itself through a fairly small incision, take out the gland itself, and, you know, hopefully get everything back to normal. Another approach is somebody who, as you might be able to see, has a prior scar. So here we can actually use a radio-guided approach. So this is the same probe that we use uh, for doing uh, sentinel lymph nodes in the operating room for breast or melanoma. The patient comes in in the morning. They go to nuclear medicine and get a tracer given. We use the probe externally on the skin, and then we can also use it through the incision to help guide us down through scar tissue to help sort of, again, get us there as expeditiously as possible and hopefully avoid injury to recurrent nerve or other things in a reoperative field. I don't use this routinely. It's, there's been good studies that have shown that in a patient who's never had surgery, had surgery in their neck before, it's an extra technique that only increased cost, increased time, so we don't use it routinely, but it is, again, another adjunct to have available. Video-assisted surgery um, was really championed by Dr. Paolo Micheli in Italy. Um, and again, not something we use frequently, but this is a patient that I saw, uh, BMI of 68. Um, her neck was bigger around than my thigh. We ultrasounded her, and her parathyroid gland was eight centimeters deep in the neck, just from the skin. 
So we started thinking about this, and I'm like, how am I going to get at eight centimeters down through a small incision? I was, this lady's going to wind up with a huge incision. She was one of the first video assistants that we did here. So this is a, a four centimeter incision. And the way we do this is we make the incision. It's gasless. We're not pumping CO2 into the neck. We're actually lifting up the tissue with some retractors from the side. We use a small five millimeter scope and then project everything up on the screen. We can see the recurrent laryngeal nerve really nicely. We can see the parathyroid gland coming out next to the thyroid. And we can dissect out a gland through a four centimeter incision that was eight centimeters deep in somebody's neck. So again, this is toolbox, okay? When you do operations, you gotta have a big toolbox. I don't use this routinely. We don't need to use this routinely, but it's something to have in your arsenal when we're looking at patients. Endoscopic surgery, this is the transaxillary approaches, okay? These are things where people are going in, they're dissecting through an axillary incision, up and over the pectoralis, up into the neck. Some people are doing this robotically. Um, certainly not prime time. We're not offering this to patients here in the university system. I don't think this is really ever going to catch fire in the United States. Most of this is being done overseas, Japan and Korea. There's a couple places in the U.S. that are doing it, but um, it's a long ride for a very short, short stretch. I can do a nice little small incision, get the same result. And there is some potentially troubling data in the, the literature out there. There was a big trial that came out in JAMA for endoscopic thyroid surgery, not parathyroid, but they had, um, out of a group of 100 patients, like 15 of them had a temporary nerve injury. They all resolved and it all got better, but 15 temporaries means you're gonna get a higher rate of permanent nerve injury at some point in time if you do enough of them. So I'm not sure this is really ever gonna be prime time. So what do we do? We um, take out the gland and we need to use IOPTH or intraop parathyroid hormone monitoring. This came on board in 96. Um, we can get cure, good cure rates. And basically what we're looking at is employing this in patients to make sure we get the right answer. And so um, the idea being, Go through a couple of these things here. Um, the idea being is that you want to take out the gland, you want to prove it's the only gland, and get a good cure for that for that patient. And as long as we get the appropriate drop and you interpret it correctly, that should happen. Um, bilateral ex exploration, though, is still important. It remains the gold standard. So if you basically have a patient that you don't think is appropriate for minimally invasive multi glands, as we talked about. Um, if someone during surgery, if their intraop parathyroid levels don't drop the way you expect and they don't come down, they probably have another gland. You've got to be able to go find the other glands. And if you have someone that you can't localize preoperatively, again, probably much more likely that they've got multi-gland disease. They still have the problem, they still have the sequelae of disease, and they still warrant operation, but you have to go probably look at all four glands. So it's still the preferred approach in that type of a patient. And the last thing is sort of, you know, how do we get a safe and effective uh, plan for these folks? So, again, what is our, what's our goal? The goal of surgery should be get biochemical cure defined as durable normal calcemia. And for this, basically, we want to make sure that the patient's post-op serum calcium levels normalize. We don't always send PTH levels. I always send PTH levels because I want to make sure, and from a research standpoint, that our patients are doing what we expect. But we have to recognize that about 40% of patients may not have a normal PTH level after parathyroidectomy. It doesn't mean they're not cured of disease. And as long as their calcium levels are normal, that's what's most appropriate. But many of these patients may actually be a little hypocalcemic temporarily because the other three glands are a bit suppressed from the one gland producing all the PTH. So if you check it in two weeks, their levels may not be fully normalized. As we said, low vitamin D levels are going to cause secondary hyperparathyroidism. Hungry bone syndrome, where they're remodeling their bone and putting that calcium back in, all that turnover can affect PTH, and renal insufficiency. So really, after surgery, we really want to check serum calcium as the mainstay, and that's what we would certainly recommend. And we want to make sure it's normal for a minimum of six months. Um, if patients have persistently elevated levels after parathyroidectomy, we have to start thinking about recurrent disease or ruling out those other causes of secondary disease. As a brief touch back to normal calcemic, this is something kind of new in the guidelines because, again, this is a, an evolving diagnosis in the literature, and there's still, again, a lot of things that are happening here. But as we said, these patients have normal baseline calcium but high PTH, so we need a new definition for cure. We can't say somebody's cured if they come back in and their PTH is high and their calcium is normal. 
That's where we started. So for these folks, we are recommending normal calcium and normal PTH at greater than six months. There's insufficient evidence out in the literature to support this guideline because there just isn't enough out there yet. So it's something, again, that you're hoping the guidelines will provoke people to start thinking about. Defining failure, there's two types of, of things we can think of. Persistent disease, this happens within the first six months of parathyroid surgery. If the calcium goes back up within six months and the ETH is back up within six months, we didn't do something right. Recurrent disease is it happens later. And why is it important? Well, it really, again, goes back to what's the etiology of the disease process. Persistent disease is usually my fault. We missed it. We didn't get the right gland, or there was multi-gland disease that wasn't appreciated, meaning maybe you fudged your PTH level a little bit and said, ah, it dropped enough, and they'll probably be okay, and you decide not to keep going. Or was there an error initial diagnosis? Did they really not even have hyperparia? Did they have FHH? Did they have a secondary problem? And you probably shouldn't have been operating on them. Another group that falls in this group is gastric bypass patients. Got to be really careful. They all have vitamin D deficiencies. They all, about 30 to 40 percent of these patients will develop secondary hyperparathyroidism due to their inability to absorb calcium. Remember, most of your calcium gets absorbed in the small intestine, about 80 percent of it in the first portion of the duodenum. Um, and so without that, these patients are going to go on. So you just have to be careful that you get the right rationale. Recurrent disease, though, is something different. This is interval development of multi-gland disease. If you, if you did an MEN patient and they had multi-gland disease and you left a remnant, did it hypertrophy? Is it becoming a problem again? Is it a parathyroid cancer patient? Did you take it out and the pathologist said, well, it was an atypical parathyroid and they're actually coming back with recurrent disease because it was cancer? Or did we get something like, did we fracture the capsule of the gland this can lead to an unusual uh, complication called parathyromatosis. Same idea when we do splenic surgery for somebody. If we break the spleen when we're taking a spleen out in an ITP uh, patient, it's a big problem. They get these little splenic implants all over the belly, and those things start to hypertrophy, and their ITP comes back. It's nearly impossible to fix. Same problem with parathyroid. If you fracture the gland and, again, we auto-transplant parathyroid, it's really good at grabbing onto new blood supply and, and regrowing roots and regrowing roots in the neck with lots of these little implants is really difficult to treat. So when we get to the point when someone needs a reoperation because they have failed surgery, we need stricter indications. We want to make sure that, you know, we're doing this for the right reason. We're probably going to increase our symptomatology and say, well, maybe just osteopenia or maybe bone pain or maybe neurocognitive symptoms are not the best idea in reoperating someone who's got mild disease. But if they've got recurrent kidney stones, ongoing fractures, worsening osteoporosis, you might have to bite the bullet and figure out what's going on and go back. Um, and then, again, most people are going to want to see some positive imaging, too. So re-operations where we can't find it, blind exploration of the neck is not a good idea either. We're not going to help that patient. This is a busy slide. This is the actual algorithm for reoperation. Don't expect you guys to, you know, have to worry about this. But, again, it's, it's what's out there in the system, and the goal is to help people walk through where do we start referring, when do we start offering surgery. Um, and when do we say surgery is not the right thing to do? Because there's, that's certainly the case, too. If we can't find objective criteria for patients and, you know, they've failed surgery once before, doing it again probably isn't going to help them. If you've got somebody who's got bad cardiac disease, has had strokes, can't come off other medications and we're worried about Plavix or uh, Effiant or something like that, a neck hematoma for somebody who's got low volume disease with, you know, kind of poor or limited expected benefit, probably not the best idea to do. And again, parathyroidectomy doesn't become cost effective unless patients have at least five years of expected remaining healthy life. So if you've got somebody who's got a lot of other things going on, offering an operation just to try to fix a small problem may not be worth it. And again, we don't want a complication in somebody. So really make sure you do this very, through a multidisciplinary approach and make sure you've got the right indication for patients. So overall, hyperparathyroidism mm -hmm. and the diagnosis and the treatment has really undergone a lot of change. We came up with these guidelines to hopefully enhance the pathway of getting people referred at the right time, image the right way, and get good outcomes and really develop this patient-centric approach. So everything in life is perception. 
Um, I was fortunate enough when I did train, uh, did my endocrine fellowship at Rush in Chicago, I lived in Oak Park, which is just west of, uh, of the city. And it's actually where the Frank Floyd Wright uh, studio is at. And there's about seven uh, of his homes that he built and designed that are right there in Oak Park. And so it was a great place just to walk around. It's beautiful architecture to interpret. And one of his statements was that art mimics nature. Anybody familiar with this building? Detroit River, the Renaissance Center in Detroit. So I'd sort of like to think that maybe they weren't quite designing a central tower with four little towers, but <laughs> maybe their perception was the parathyroid. So thank you guys very much for your uh, attention today and be happy to answer any questions for you.